do we think that a Samoan at this age or at this time is someone that should be considered? For me, uh, that question, I don't think it's, it's, it, it should be possible because he himself knows that it's not fit if he's not been playing actively. And we need active players to be called to our national teams. Today's edition of Sports Chat will continue our preview of the 2022 World Cup. And today we are speaking to a man who excited us and gave us a lot of memories on the pitch. A Ghanaian football legend, the heart of folk legend, and the heart of Scotland legend. Lyle Kinson, a lot of Lyle. It's our guest on Sports Chat today. My name is Perez as well. Call. The conversation begins once we come back from this break. Welcome back from the break. This is Sports Chat. My name is Perez as well. Call. I'm speaking to Lyle Kinson. Right, Lyle, like, thanks for coming out to your office. Thanks for having me. Uh, there is a question that I always ask players who have switched into coaching. How is the transition like from playing as an active footballer to now being the dad Oh, it's, it's, it's two different, different things. Because uh, when, as a player, you only think about yourself and your performance, what is going to happen on the pitch. Uh, uh, as a coach, you're thinking for Let's say if you have 25 players, you think it for all of them. You, you think about planning, you think about your periodization, you think about your weekly plan, you think about your monthly planning, you think about yearly planning, and also you think about how your team is going to perform. Also, another thing that is most important thing is to, for you to get used to the squad, and the squad to also get used to you. Yeah winning games, whatever will happen during the year is something that you should be worried about. Um, players, man, you manage players' egos, uh, and now coaches are managers as well, so you have to manage even your backroom staff sure. and all that. So, uh, big difference. As a player, you're thinking about yourself and performance. As a coach, you're thinking about so many people. You, you work with the Right to Dream Academy, and I'm sure you came across Mohamed for this who is now doing so well at IL when you look at the talent you saw at that young level to the player as you come now, what, what, what do you think about him? Um, I'm, I, I'm not surprised at all seeing him getting to the top. Um, I quite remember when I first visited Right to Dream, I wasn't working with them. Okay. I've been friends with Right to Dream for a long time. I wasn't working with them, so once in a while I go and visit the boys. I've even adopted two, I adopted two of their... Yeah, nice. Uh, first generation group. Uh, one is on his own, but uh, the other one is still with me till today. Sure. Um, I visited and I saw someone that I can see that in future will be beneficial for the country. So when I saw Cruz growing through the ranks of right to dream, moving to FC Nottingham, they yeah, are feeling, feeling club in, 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 in Denmark, I wasn't surprised at all. But hey, he, he, as he grows, he has to change. Before he was playing very deep in the middle. And as he grows, his style changes. Or the way right to dream developing changed. And also right to dream style of play. And the way he's playing, they started playing him as a false nine, which for me, I think is, is a very good uh, dimension for him. And he's doing very, very well. Now, now let's come to the Blasters. Last month we played against uh, Brazil and Nicaragua. We lost to Brazil and we defeated Nicaragua. Some say that when you are preparing for matches, the results don't matter a lot compared to the performance of the team. Based on what you watch, what are some of the lessons, what are some of the things that you spotted in those two matches? Um, yeah, uh, preparation uh, at this crucial moment, we all know that we have, we, we had just three games to play in the main tournament. Yeah. So already, as a technical man, I will already make Ghanaians understand that, okay, this is the team I'm going with. You know, so we, and the players too should understand so that they will, they will be able to reflect on what they will, should do. But now you're keeping the players hungry. Most, most countries in the world now, they know they are starting in level. Yeah. Against Brazil, we saw the team, they, they, they parade against us. Yeah. Their, their second game against Tunisia, 
you saw the team did not change at all. Sure. Unlike us, that we played with a different team. Our second game, we played a total different team as well. You know, so so first of all, we should be able to understand, know that okay, this is the set that we, if anything happens, the tournament is going to start now. This is the team we're going mm -hmm. to present to to, to lead us. Do, do you think the, the coaches have that they have a clear idea of who the players will start up as? Uh, yes, of course, I'm sure that the coaches have. But we have different coaches. Some coaches too, they like to play with the players' mind, they like to play with the, the, with the public mind. But for me, in, from my side, my opinion is it's always clear for you. Like, like when we were playing in the national team, my time. Ghanaians can even close their eyes and mention the starting 11. That's how come Doya, Djokovic built the team. And we played together for some time and we had understanding among ourselves. And then we, we got results that qualified us to the first ever, ever World Cup. So for me, I think we should have it now. And then also in the game itself against Brazil, we gave them too much respect. Okay. We gave them too much respect. Fine, it could be a game plan, but the moment, that's, that's why in coaching, you are not a prisoner to your plan. You are not a prisoner to your approach. When you get into the game, things doesn't work, you should be able to, to, to change as soon as possible. So for me, I believe we give them too much respect. We sat and wait for them in the, in the middle to, to press, but the intensity in our pressing in the middle was very low. Mm -hmm. Playing against a, 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 a team like Brazil that they are very good on the ball, make sure you make it difficult for them to, to, to feel comfortable on the ball. We, did, we didn't do that in the first half. But I give credit to the technical team because the second half, they realized and they changed formation. And changing formation also helped us. Because when we are defending in our box, in our half, we have five at the back. Yeah. We have four in front one. and one in front of them. So it makes it difficult for the Brazilians to have the breakthrough. That's how come we, we, we held them for some time. I'm happy you mentioned the second half because there are some people think that based on our performance in the second half, where we switched to a third, five, three, five, two in attack, and a 5-4-1 in defense. There are some who think that, based on the current crop of players, the best setup or the best status should be the, the three-back system. There are those who also think that, look, Ghana is strong for attacking football. So we should go with the usual 4-3-3 or 4-4-2. If you have watched the team, what would you suggest? Yeah, if you say Ghana is used to <laughs> attacking football, which means you are saying that if you are playing three-back, you cannot attack. You can attack. Yes. If, you are, if you are playing three-back, when you are defending, you have five at the back. You have either three and two or four and one, which makes it very good in defensive. But then again, when you have, when, when you have the ball, you, you will definitely have six or even seven players going up. The only players that you leave at the back will be the three centre-backs. Center the wing back, remember, they are wingers yeah. in, in that formation. Yeah. When they take joint attack, the two attackers in up front, then you have three in the two in the middle as well. So so for me, for me, I think when you are attacking in that formation, you can still push men forward because you are on the ball. Especially in the opponent half, you can leave the three to have the attacking balance for you to go and threaten the, the opponent ball. So I I, I think it's a it's, it's it's a possibility that we should use it, especially the type of players that we have. Especially you have Salisu there, you have Jeku yeah. and Amati who have played very well together for some time. Salisu is a player that you won't be able to put him out. Jeku too will be solid. Amate will be solid. So go for three back. And you have wing backs that can go in Panis Torek, Lamte. Yeah. He can go. Odo himself, he can also go forward. If you go to the left back, Mabara Man is a bit slow, but he can also sometimes go 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 happen and cause surprises. Even so, Gideon Mesa is equally Gideon Mesa, Gideon Mesa as well. Gideon Mesa at the moment currently is more athletic than Babara. Mm -hmm. So look at if you have Gideon Mesa on the left left wing back, Torek Lante on the right, you have players, numbers that can go up front and then go and manage the opponent. So like I said, you are you are you are right. We can stick to our back three because we have the type of players that can play for us. Now let's come to the group itself. We've been paired against Uruguay, um, Portugal, 
and South Korea. Let's take them country by country. Now we are coming up against Cristiano Ronaldo, Portugal. We played them in the 2014 World Cup. We lost by 2-1. You look at the current crop of Portuguese players, Rafael Liao, Bernardo Silva, Fortnite, Diego Yota. Yesterday was ruled up, but they still have a, no a number of talents. How should we approach that game? What are some of the things that you would want to see in that game? And how can we shackle the Portuguese attack so that they don't, we don't concede, or at least, even if we concede, we don't, they don't humiliate us? We take the game to every opponent. I don't know whether maybe that's my style, that's why I'm saying that. But other coaches too will have different thoughts. But with me, I want my team to gain total control over the game. Throughout the game, we want to dominate everywhere. So I want, I want to attack. So uh, going into the Portuguese, Portugal game, especially they have players that they, if you are sitting back, they can unlock your defense. Yeah. Especially if you're playing against a team that they are very good, they will be patient. You frustrate them at some point, but they will be patient. Ask yourself if you, if you can hold them throughout the 90 minutes. So it's always good to take the game to the opponent and see how they also deal with that. But there is, there is a big question of how do you stop Ronaldo from scoring? Even in 2014, Koku Bonsam said he was going to do Juju and he would score, but he still managed to score. To score of course, yeah. at Manchester United, he's not been playing as regular, like but mm. we still know that Ronaldo on any good day can do that damage. How do we stop Ronaldo from, from scoring against them? Um, he, he, I'm, I'm, I'm a type of coach that I don't focus on opponent individual players. Okay. Because I believe it's a team sports. Individual players, of course, he have, he have his qualities. But, but the way and the way my team will perform will silence him okay. totally. Because definitely the Black Stars will have their defensive principles and their attacking principles governing everything in the, in the opponent half and in their half as well. So Ronaldo, big player, big player. The only problem that I will have with him when close to our box. And we have Jiku, who is very strong in the air. We have Salisu that have stopped world top class strikers for the past years. So I don't think I don't see us having problem at all. Ronaldo is a big player, you can't take anything away from him. But the focus should be on the team performance, but not on the individual. All right, thank you very much, like this. We are going for a break and we'll come back. We are going to look at Uruguay, South Korea, and to other interesting aspects of the game. His favorite song, his favorite Blasters player, and his favorite team in the national team. Yes, this is first check. I'll be back. Welcome back from the British Sports. My name is Perez as well. In the first start of the show, we spoke to Lai Kinson about how to deal with Portugal, his coaching. And after this, now let's look at Uruguay. There are a lot of people, as soon as the draw has done, it's like, oh, it's time to get on about Luis Suarez, to revenge uh, 2010. Should we go into the game with that mindset of revenge, or should I approach this at, at a normal game? It should be as a game of revenge, because Suarez cost us. <laughs> so it's a payback time. I think for me, I think that's what is going to motivate us more. Wouldn't to, that to put prove to them. pressure on the players rather too? Pressure is good. Okay. Pressure is good. For, for me, I, I believe pressure brings the best out of me. So pressure is good. Pressure can make you and break you. It depends on how you, you deal with it. So, so for me, pressure is very good. If there is pressure on them, they know that they are, there is something at stake. That's when, there's, if there is no pressure, that's when complacency will set in and then, and then before they realize the game is so, over. So for me, for me, I, I think it's, it should be a game of what? Revenge. Revenge. But they cost us to go past the quarterfinal stage <laughs> to make history. <laughs> what, what were you that day when, when that happened? Do you uh, remember? Yeah, I remember. I was watching. I was home watching. You know, I was supposed to be there though, but <laughs> it did not happen. <laughs> how, how was the feeling like, you know, when someone made that penalty? How, 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 what was your initial reaction? It, and, and looking at the minutes to the game was already over. You know, so you look at these situations and you be like, it's not meant to be. Because when you look at someone, he did, the power behind the ball, the the spot he picked, everything was right. 
the goalkeeper was not even close to the ball, but he hit the woodwork. So for me, I, I felt it, it's not meant to be. He did everything right, but... Did you, did you cry, though? Um, uh, not really. <laughs> but I spoke not, to John Pinter. Really, I, I, I spoke to John Pinter. I spoke to John Pinter. He said on the bus, almost all the players, they, they were, were they they were, were crying. They were crying because they, they know that they were just small to make history. You know, to make history. So everyone will be disappointed. We will come to why you were not part of the squad, but <laughs> let's go to South Korea. Some people feel, based on what I've seen, I think that they pose the biggest threats because they afford a three. I think they have a solid team. When you say a team that has a plan, that know what they do. Should we be scared of you? But should we South Korea? Should we underrate them? So, and for South Korea, apart from some hit they don't have players. So, or should we take that game seriously? Now, now, what I, where I'm sitting now, James doesn't play football anymore. James doesn't play football anymore. Now, the dimension of the game is changing. You have uh, a lot of coaches that, when it comes to tactics, they understand they can, they can steady the opponent and have. Uh, a strategy to beat the South Korea, yes. And, and again, in, the, in this tournament, there is no underdog in the tournament. You don't have to underrate anybody in, the, in that tournament because football has become very tactical now. So the team that will be tactically disciplined and perform well on the day sure, will surely carry the day. You know? so, so, yes, I know people will say, okay, South Korea, but they are also playing good football. They've been in the system, they've, they've been in the World Cup for some time now, yeah. so they understand the terrain as well. So they are a team that every opponent that will meet, meet them uh, have respect for them. I mean, based on, we've looked at all the three teams in our groups and uh, how Ghana is going to play. You feel that we should go with. Based on the kind of squad we have now, looking at our opponents, are you confident that we'll be able to sail through to the next one? In our group? Yes, we'll be able to qualify to the yes, Lampard yes, that, that's our aim. That's our aim. Um, every team that goes into that tournament, their aim is to go beyond the stage. Talking of Ghana that have been there uh, three, three times, this is their fourth time. So they, they also know the terrain and they know that they have to, the first time they, we don't believe that we'll go to the next round. Sure. And then what happened? We went past it. Our second time, it's the same. You know, so, so for me, I think. We, we have what it takes to go through a, a group because the Portugal we played in, in 2014 yes. was very close, very close. Way, to, to Portugal. So, and Uruguay, we beat them, we dominated play, we should have killed the game in the, in, even in the first half. So, so, for me, I think we will be able to, to go through and I see Ghana, Uruguay going through there. Portugal will make it to the next one? I don't think so. Wow. I don't think so. so. If we are to go through, I know you say you don't bore your team around names, but whether we like it or not, every team has a spine. Mm. The generation of your black stars had a spine. John Mensah, Mike Lason, mm. Slim Entire, that was the spine. Mm. If we are to impress at the World Cup, which players need to step up? For which players are we counting on to step up for Ghana to be able to push us to the next round? Um, you, you, you forgot about our goalkeeper that time. You know, yes, that's the most important place. If the ball passes the goalkeeper, then you lose. You score ten, but you concede. So, 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 so when Tari said during that time, whenever the ball passed, then he wasn't worried because he knew. He knew Ole was, so. was yes. there. So, so first of all, we need to look at uh, goalkeeping department. It looks, it looks like we've not had someone that we believe in. You know, so uh, I believe by this time we should have it. So, the most important place will be the goalkeeper, the goalkeeping department. Of course, looking at the team that we have, we all have to pray for Thomas Teplo, even Arsenal. If he's not there, you can see the team is not the same. I'm an Arsenal fan. Whenever we're playing, he's <laughs> not in Charlie. I get worried. He's like, for me, he's the most important player for Arsenal. Yeah. And yeah, I feel I agree he can you. be the most important player for, for Ghana. I agree. The difference you. between the Arsenal team when Partey is playing mm. and when it's not playing is huge. Yes. And if we are even going to win the level, even make top five, I think it's Partey. So I, I agree with you perfectly that Ghana needs, really, really needs Partey. Yes, you can see against Brazil when he pulled out of in the, in the warm up. You can see uh, everything, the planning and everything like got missing. So for me, I think he's the, he's the most important. 
and play in the team. We need to focus on and, and help him, help him to lead the team. You know? what, what about the, the attack line? What are the likes of Kudus? They are you. Who are some of the players that you are counting on to step up for? Uh, Kudus, of course. Kudus, Kudus the, in the attacking force, and I see Inyaki Williams with his experience and uh, him being the consistency that he put up in the La Liga. I, I, I believe he's going to bring a lot for us. You know, so we look at Inyaki Williams leading the attack, Kudus Mohamed, Pate. Pate, and then we find a solid, a solid goalkeeper for that. Don't lie, and this will be a controversial question. Your friend has some he, he said that if he's able to prove fitness, mm. we should add him to this. But he would like to be part of the team. Do we think that as a modern at this age or at this time, is someone that should be considered? First of all, he has to be active. And he's not been active for, for some time now. So, so adding him to the squad, it won't be fair on the country and then some of the players at all. And, and then again, football, sometimes you can play football at home You've been out for some time now, and you can play football at home, but when you get to the bigger stage, you need to be 100% fit. Not only fit, but you should have much fitness, because the energy you put in the game is different from what you put in training. So, for me, uh, that question, I don't think it's, it's, it should be possible, because he himself knows that he's not fit, if he's not been playing actively, and we need active players to be called to our national teams. Okay. Now, let's do, there are some people also argue that we should have some local players in the squad, in the final 26. Do you think we should just pick players just for the play in the local league, or should it be some quality? Or you think that because it's a national team, if there are certain players who have proved in the local league that they can play, we should at least add one or two to the squad? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a Ghana team, and every Ghanaian player is qualified to play. And you talk about our local league performing well, and the coach in charge believe that oh, he have what it takes to help the squad achieve something. Why not? Fini Fini Banya is is part of the squad now. He's a local player. We can still if another player is there in the coach field, he can help. Why not? They are all Ghanaians. If you can go outside Ghana and and bring players that grew up in Europe to come and play for us, why not? our leave. We should also do that. Let, let me go back to me to your. How did you find out that you were not going to be <laughs> part of the team for the World Cup? Um, a day before we play Holland, a day before we leave in, actually leave into the tournament, that's when I was told that I will, I will not be part of it. I, the management called me uh, in the evening, around 9 after our dinner. They called me for a meeting and I got to the room and I saw like, like, like we are in cabinet, they post it, oh, okay. And I was like, wow, something is going to happen. And then they told me, no, this is the end of the road. We have a lot of games to play. I still have, I said, no, no, I don't have any more future with the national team again because I, I feel I was aging and that tournament will be my last tournament for the national team. So that I'll be focused on my, on my club. Club football. So what was your initial reaction when you were told that lie? You know? I was disappointed. I was dis disappointed because 2006, I did everything to qualify the team. It did not happen. 2010 to the same, I did everything to qualify the team. Again, I was dropped again. So I was totally shattered. I was disappointed. Because every player's dream is to play in the World Cup. <laughs> Today, if you ask me if I'm satisfied with my career, with my career, I'll be yes. Perform the work out. I, I personally think that you weren't treated fairly. I have a policy and I would say that for me there are certain players that when they show dedication and patriotism to the Black Stars, at some point when they also need the national team, you should also give them the platform. That's why I particularly wasn't worried when Mubarak Wakaso was invited for the recent game because I feel mm. he has been dedicated he and committed. Deals. And yeah. if you feel that giving the Black Stars for some two games will allow him recover his confidence, we should do that. That's my policy. That's why I feel that the country wasn't fair, fair to you, but it's going on now. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. never know. Maybe I will be there as a coach, right? I mean, do you dream of coaching a player? Yes, of course. <laughs> yes, of course. It's one of the uh, things that pushed me to go into coaching because I felt uh, 
what I should do in football, even though I'm satisfied. I'm not done with that. And if I have to be in the World Cup. You win with the World Cup with Ghana? Yeah, if, if it's possible. If I get, I'm there, we take it a game at a time and we'll get there. Now, let's carry it. You play with Mark Lee, so that was like a galaxy of, of stars. You had some of the best footballers we've seen. Yeah. Who was your favorite amongst them? Who was like your closest, your friend? Aside from your brother, like, uh, Olivier? Uh, Steven Appiah. Uh, Steven Appiah because we all grew up together. Steven Appiah grew up in Choco. I grew up in Jamestown, Buko. And when we were young, we knew each other when we were like eight, nine years. Okay. Till today. So it's like when, when Steven was in Choco, he was playing for Mighty V3, Coach Team. I was playing for Cowlin Davis. And the rivalry between us was huge. You know, I want to perform well against him. And he also wants to perform well. He has his fans. Those days, it's crazy. We, I have my own fans, Jamestown. I have my fans, Steven Appiah, too, Choco. He has his fans there. So uh, we've known each other for, for a while. And when we get to the national team, it makes it easy. My Kalesi and Sule Mutari, too, they've been together with Sly Tete. So they also have that love between them. So that's why me, I'm not, I wasn't surprised at all that we understood each other very well. That's why the people name us like Quartet. Yeah. You know, so I, I, Steve Yapia was someone that so, I was So let's say you guys were like brothers. Yes, yes. We, we, me and Steven, we, we share everything. Okay. Everything together. And what about your brother? What's the relationship? How? Yeah, we, he's my big brother. You know, he's my big brother. But as we grow, you know, then the, the respect started piling up. Yeah. So, so we talk, but the way I will go with Stephen Apia, I won't be able to so go with yeah. him. My brother too will not feel comfortable. If I'm around, he cannot do certain things. If, I, if my brother is around, we are, we are cool. It's, it's, I mean, it's like that with brothers. <laughs> I mean, at some point, it becomes... So, but let me, my last few questions. Do you follow Ghanaian music? Ghanaian music? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So who is your favorite musician? Shatter. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> and your favorite Shatter Alison? Oh, I, I have a lot. I don't have one. Even Bandana from Ghana. The way, way back. Yeah. You can even, sing even that one too. Oh, I, I, I forget the lyrics. I'm not a good singer as well. And, 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 and also uh, Kofi Kenata. Oh. You know, I, I love his song. I love his what song, what's song. about Kenata that you like? Uh, he's calm. You know, and Shatter is... Uh, so hot and cold, Good. you know. If I want giddy uh, giddy sound, yes, shut up. But Kofi Kinata, his songs are very cool, and the lyrics inside is well educated. My last question, though, you are you are into coaching or what should we expect from Lyak in the coach? Um, I want Ghanaians to to see what I can bring on board. Uh, I have my style. And all I need is opportunity. Everyone needs opportunity. Everyone needs this opportunity to show what you have in this team. I've, I've, I've taken my journey, in my, my coaching journey, a day at a time. I've been very, I've taken my steps very well to educate myself to where I am now. And I've not stopped, I'm still pushing. I did my CAF B license did my UEFA A license, a B license, and now I'm on my UEFA A license. So I want to educate myself to the highest level, to understand the dy dynamics of the game, because the game keeps changing. If you stop, then people will come and pass you. So my aim is to educate myself well and pass it on to Ghana football. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So this is Sports Check, and we'll be speaking to the legend, Lion Kingston. So we're coming up with another edition. My name is Perez, it's Rafa, Apon. Hey, that's all, how you wrap up, Apon. Listen, child.
the GMPC was established as our national oil company to one, hold our interest in the oil fields, i.e. the carried and participating interest, and also look at the possibility of having commercial interest. And so GMPC is a strategic company. If you go to Saudi Aramco, you go to Petrobras and all those other national oil companies, they are doing a very, very good job for their country. And so in as much as I agree that GMPC may be veering off their core duty, if we can reposition GMPC and it becomes a profit-making entity, they can even give some dividend and some money to government to put into such other activities that we are talking about. Mr. Speaker, I'm very, very worried about the state of GMPC reading this report. And if you look at page four, it starts with the profitability assessment of the company. If you look at the gross profit margin, which is the gross profit as expressed as a percentage of your total sales, it has reduced from 50% in 2018 to 26% in 2019 to 0.3% in 2020. This is serious. From 50% to less than 1%. If you look at the operating profit, which is also your operating profit expressed as a percentage of sales, it has moved from 28% to negative 19.23%. And your operating profit is mostly your total sales less the cost of sales. And so it means that compared to what they sold and what they bought, they've made a loss. Return on capital employed, that is the capital that you employ, everybody expects to make some return from the money that you employ into the organization. They are making, they are making a negative 16. So you are even better off putting that capital in treasury bills. Because you invest in order to make some profit. Mr. Speaker, if you look at the current ratio, and the current ratio would normally look at your current liability and your current assets. Because within a year, you ought to sell and you also ought to pay. Those that goes beyond a year are known as long term. But the current ones has to do with what happens within the year. It was 1.08, which means that you can cover your current liability and still have something. Today is 0.88. So when you take your total current assets, and sell it and you go to pay your total current liability, you cannot meet that. Such a company is, is bound to collapse. The worst of all is even the asset test, because the asset test ratio deals with cash and cash equivalent. It means that today if you move into GMPC and, and make noise that you want your money, bearing in mind that money doesn't like noise, Bearing in mind that she can't pay the day, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> yes, because money doesn't like noise. She can't pay the day. But with this ratio, acid test ratio, there's more noise you make on Mr. Speaker. <laughs> in the same way, in as much as she can't pay the day, with this ratio, you can also say that she can't pay the <laughs> So, Mr. Speaker, it's a serious matter. This company is on the verge of collapse and something ought to be done about it.
digital, you know.